Hello and welcome to another episode of Half Court Press. He's Wilson Moore. I'm John Walker. We're here to talk some basketball, per usual, Wilson. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of what we do around here. Big East Media Day was this week. Fred Hoiberg talked down in Lincoln. Um, but before we dive into all of that, with the season less than two weeks away at this point, how are you, man? I'm doing pretty well. You know, I'm looking forward to the season getting here. I feel like I've said that like we, at this point of every yeah. episode, but yeah. it's it's true. You hear things a lot when they're true, and you know it's, it's about time for basketball season to start. I know we live in a we live in a state that's pretty nuts about football, and that's yeah. all, that's all fine and good. But it's uh, getting it to be about that time. Yeah, it, it, it sure is. We're recording this on Friday, October 25th. Nebraska season starts. What, November 4th? That's the first day for yeah, college that, basketball? Yeah, that Monday, yep. Um, so, you know, merely days from now, really, in the grand scheme of things. Creighton season starts two days later in Omaha. Um, so it is on the horizon. We can see the sun setting, raise Simba in the air, you know, whatever you have to do. Um, everything the light touches. Everything the light touches, you know. That'll be a good visual for anybody watching it, which you should do. But you can listen to it everywhere as well. On your favorite podcast provider. <laughs> um, we are doing this on a Friday afternoon. Just a little uncommon for us. Yeah, but I think, you yeah. know, hey, it's, I, if, you're re- if you're listening to this, maybe it's been a long week of work. you got to unwind. Maybe you're driving home from work right now. Just a little basketball talk to get you into the weekend. Yeah, and, and it was a pretty big week, at least for Creighton. Big Ten Media Day was way, way, way at the beginning of this month. It feels like an eternity ago at this point. But Big East Media Day was a little bit later. It was this Wednesday. And Creighton had a pretty decent showing, all things considered. Ryan Kalkbrenner, the Big East preseason player of the year. Creighton picked to finish second in the Big East, only behind the defending, reigning, undisputed, back-to-back national champ Huskies. Um, Steven Ashworth was third team, all Big East. And, and so life's good at Creighton right now. You know, two of the better players in the conference, obviously, with Kalk and Ashworth. Um you know, according to the league's coaches, obviously. And Creighton, again, expected to be one of the best teams in the Big East. I personally was a little bit shocked that Ryan Kalkbrenner was the preseason player of the year. Yeah. Not because of his ability, but because we are talking about the Big East. We're not yeah. talking about the Big Midwest. And I just felt like people thought a lot of the Kadari Richmond move to St. John's. Yeah. So I was a bit shocked, again, that Ryan Kalkbrenner was the preseason player of the year, not because of his ability, because he's been one of the best centers in the country over the last you know couple of years, but because I just thought with all of these Eastern-based teams, yeah. um, you know that that Kadari Richmond would would be the preseason player of the year. You probably saw that. M- probably weren't up as early as I was on Wednesday morning to probably uh, wasn't to try to see that um but but what were your thoughts when you eventually got up and and moving around on Wednesday and saw that Ryan Kalkbrenner was the preseason player of the year in the Big East you know it struck me as uh um that sounds about right you know I'm obviously I'm not as plugged into the Big East as you but I do know you know that's um this is a this is a league that lost some of its uh some pretty good players you know guys like Tyler Kolick um who are no no longer there, and it kind of felt like Kalkbrenner, um, sort of the last man standing. Yeah. You know, he's a uh, um, he's a guy who's been doing this for a while, and I think these kind of preseason award preseason awards tend to reward that. Yeah. You don't. It's not often you'll see like you know a transfer or someone like that get that. You know, we saw that in the Big Ten with Zach Eady um, winning it two years in a row, and then more recently, just this year, you know, Braden Smith, the guy who's right. now a junior and has started going into his third year at Purdue. So I wasn't shocked. Um, you know, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not as into the minutiae sure. of, the, of sure. the big East, but um, it, 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 it made sense to me. It, it didn't raise any red flags. No, to me, I'll say that. no, no, it certainly didn't. I think it was like, he w- he was one of three that, you know, if it happened, I wouldn't have been shocked. It would have yeah. been Richmond, Kalk, and I don't know, throw Alex Caravan in there as the yeah. only returner. From UConn. See, and, that, and that's tough because, you know, you really think, like, who was, like, the who was the best player on that UConn team? Right. I mean, you can make a case for a lot of guys. So Cam good. Spencer, exactly. Stephon Castle, uh, Donovan Klingon. Like, yeah. you can you can make a case for a lot of guys. There wasn't That was not a team. 
you know, it's one of the best college basketball teams the past decade at yeah, least. Yeah, no, they were for not, sure. Not led by one star. No, 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 not at all. And and I think that's part of why UConn's been so good. Uh, but we're not here to talk about UConn. Maybe we are. I don't know. But we uh, we're tangentially. Long, yeah, we're a long way from stores. Creighton's a long way from going to stores. Um, so the the interesting thing, obviously, I'm assuming this is how every league in the country is. Coaches are not allowed to pick their players for these awards, just like they're not allowed to pick uh, their own teams in the preseason poll, which is kind of what I thought was interesting because if UConn is picked first, surely the only other first place vote, Dan Hurley's, would go to Creighton, right? The team that has quite literally been a thorn in the Husky side since they rejoined the Big East. And it didn't. It went to Marquette. Um, which was picked to finish fourth. Hmm. So the Big East, the Big East preseason poll worked out with uh, UConn at the top, obviously Creighton two, Xavier three, Marquette four. In the only first place vote that didn't go to number one, went, went to, to one. number four. That's interesting. It's really interesting. So that's Marquette's definitely in more of a. I mean, they're going to be good, but like. No it was like Kolek, kind of, kind no of a Iguodaro. transitional, yeah, tr- you know, Kolik, Iguodaro, like that's. It's a lot to lose. Yeah. And, but they also return a lot, you know, because they didn't lose much. Like Tyler and Iguodaro were really kind of their only departures. So, you know, they returned Cam Jones, Stevie Mitchell, guys who were on this preseason team. Um, you know, Cam Jones was preseason all big east first team so a guy who's going to be really good in his own right but i thought that was interesting that dan hurley's vote did not go to the team that perennially gives the huskies tough games um you know the meeting in the meeting in stores last year Klingon comes back creighton didn't play well whatsoever Um, but then we saw what happened when when the huskies came to omaha and in the jays beat them for their first ever win over the number one team in the country after whiffing on the you know past six tries um so yeah I, I i just thought that was interesting a lot to come out of big east media day but i uh i i really i really 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 think think that ryan kalkbrenner kind of got the recognition that he and greg mcdermott have been searching for for creighton's big man you know greg mcdermott wasn't shy about that whatsoever he was given the floor by John Fanta to say literally anything that he wanted to about Ryan Kalkbrenner. And he said, you know, he deserve. I think he deserves a little more credit. This was after he had been named preseason Big East player of the year. Um, you know, and then he went on to talk about, you know, Donovan Klingon is going to have a good NBA career, but how different is Ryan Kalkbrenner, at least defensively, yeah. you know? And uh, so, yeah, it seems like Ryan Kalkbrenner got the, uh, the recognition that, you know, again, he and Greg McDermott and Creighton uh, have been looking for for him. And I think that's kind of the beginning of the campaign for player of the year. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when they, and they should, when they start to officially campaign that, um, I, I think we will look back to, you know, Big East Media Day and this episode and, and everything in between and realized that the campaign started long before the season yeah. did. Um, but enough about Creighton. We'll come back to them in a little bit because Nebraska, which has an exhibition this weekend, much like Creighton does, had an availability on Thursday where you got to talk to Fred Hoiberg for the first time in what, a couple of weeks? A couple of weeks, yeah. What'd you learn from Fred down in Lincoln? Oh, we talked, we talked to him and we talked to Connor Siegen. Uh, big time transfer. Big time transfer. Yeah, it's funny we've we've not talked to Connor three times in the preseason, which I mean, spokesman. So, yeah, cl- clearly. I mean, um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know everything is appears to be going according to plan um, from the Nebraska uh, for Nebraska. You know, no one has uh, any serious injuries. Um, Sam Hoiberg sat out the uh, sat out the scrimmage. Okay, with that was the, a, that, those were that was probably the most notable thing, right? Yeah, and, and Andrew Morgan has a concussion. Is the other thing. It sounds like um, they're hoping he'll be back by the time the season starts, so he won't play 
in the exhibition against Grand Valley State on Sunday, but they're hoping he'll be back uh, by a week later when they play Texas Rio Grand Valley. Just kind of crazy, just as a side note. They play yeah. two teams with the words Grand Valley. In the, like, that's wild, right? I thought you were – that is wild. <laughs> I thought you were going to note that Texas Rio Grand Valley opens the season November 4th at Nebraska – and two days later, comes to Omaha to yeah. play Creighton. So someone did. Someone did that last year, like Florida A and M or someone yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that, so. That, so I, I, that's not you know. Not you're uncommon. a mid. You're a mid major. You take those checks wherever you can get them, and if yeah. you can, if you can cash two on one road trip, then more power to you. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. It, was there anything else from Fred yesterday? Or were those the two notables? And and if those were the if those were the two notables, do you think they'll both be ready for the opener? Obviously, it's not really the biggest rush in the world to yeah. get them back. I, I would expect them to do from what Fred said. It sounded mostly precautionary, especially in uh, Sam's case with Andrew, right, Mo- with Andrew right. Morgan. It's more, you know, can he pass, you know, through the concussion right. protocols. Uh, I guess my other big takeaway was just that he, uh, Fred said he's still, you know, he has an idea of the rotations, but nothing's really set in stone. And that's that's how really Mac is, my, too. That, that, that's been my kind of big thing I've been wondering about this whole time, just in what Nebraska is going to look like yeah. on the floor this year. They they ran eight-man rotation last year. This season they have, you know, in theory, ten guys who could uh, um, who could play, you know, not and that's not even counting, like, the freshmen or right. the walk-ons. Like, you know, they've um, – so, it you know, someone's going to get left behind, I think. Whether they go eight or nine, someone is going to end up as the odd man out, and maybe it'll take a little bit for us to yeah. fully see who that is. But that's just what I'm interested in, how, how they manage their, those rotations, how they uh, distribute the playing time among the big guys, you know, if they want, because they have a lot of flexibility there of Absolutely. lineups, you know. Do they put two of them on the floor at the same time? You know, do you go... Braxton Mia and Berke Buchtengel or Andrew Morgan. That's on, good. I couldn't. I, yeah, you've got that down now, <laughs> yeah. huh? I, I've written enough. I know how to spell it, too. Yeah. So. No notes, uh, no nothing. Yeah. But, you know, you, you know, it's a, lots of options. Go big, go small. And yeah. those are things we'll learn maybe a little bit against yeah, Grand Valley State. Sure. We'll learn maybe a little more a week later against Texas Rio Grande Valley. But we really won't know – for sure until several weeks in when things kind Absolutely. of when things solidify a little Absolutely. bit more. Absolutely. And and that's kind of the the reason why Fred Hoiberg structures his non-conference schedule the way he did Creighton's as a whole is a lot harder, I yeah. would say. Oh, for sure. I don't think that's a stretch yeah. by, you know, by any means. I think it's a stretch to say Alabama and Kansas <laughs> are know? tougher than um, uh, I mean, FDU did beat a one seed, so That's true. <laughs> But Nebraska hasn't been a one seed. Creighton hasn't, you know, either, you know. So I think they're both safe. Um, that That's, you know, that's one of the things that I think we'll learn when these coaches experiment over the first few weeks. Yeah. Uh, because Nebraska, you know, like I said, they're non-con. They're going to be able to experiment for quite a while um, with some of the teams they play and when they play them. Creighton has four mid-majors at home to open the season before they really get going against Nebraska, then the Players Era Festival, yeah. then Bama and Kansas. So I, I think we'll see that. Um, we'll certainly have a good idea of maybe where certain players stand in terms of the rotation at both Nebraska and Creighton after this weekend yeah. and the exhibitions. Um, but let's stop there for a second. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about a couple of position breakdowns and what to watch for in the uh, exhibitions this weekend. Let's go. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Are we just good to go? Okay, cool. Okay. Speaking of the rotation, Wilson. <laughs> Speaking of it. Well, uh, we've spent a lot of time this preseason, as a college basketball reporter does, thinking of all these different lineups and how they can mesh together and what would work and what would not work. Um, But more importantly, we've broken down one for ourselves, two for everyone, 
what pieces Nebraska and Creighton are working with in their front court, in their back court, and on the wings. Um, we've done position breakdowns for all three of those groups. After doing that, because I believe we just did the yeah, just third of three with, this week. Yep. Um, Post. What What would you say is Nebraska's most interesting, vital, crucial position group? However, you want to look at that. I think it's the big men, and I mean. You can make a case for the guards just because sure. they have two true point guards this year, which they did not last year. Yeah. So I'm interested in how that helps the offense. If Good they problem. Can push, yeah, they can push the pace a little bit more. Um, you know, things can run a bit more smoothly. But big men just stick out to me because they got three new ones this year. You know, last year the four and the five yeah. were Rink Mast and Josiah Alec, and that's neither of them are going to play this year. So they got three new big men. They got Braxton Mia, they got Berke Buchtengel, and they got Andrew Morgan. Yeah. And those are three guys with very different skill sets. I'd say. Uh, you know, Braxton Mia is, he's a guy that, another guy in Nebraska didn't really have last year. You know, a 7-1 rim protector. They didn't have a rim protector last year. Right. A guy who, in theory, you know, if they're getting thrashed down low the way they did against Illinois in the Big Ten uh, tournament the way they did against Texas A and M in the NCAA tournament, that that's Braxton Mia time. You yeah. know that's that is what they got him for for those physical games to get rebounds and block shots and match up with the teams yeah. that kind of physically overpowered them. I'm I'm not saying anywhere remotely that uh, in any way remotely that Braxton Mia is Ryan Kalkbrenner, yeah. but from watching a seven foot one center go to work on both ends yeah. of the floor last year it changes everything yeah and i i am excited just the the matchup that we'll get in early december of mia versus kalk yeah uh, specifically when nebraska is on defense and creighton is on offense you know yeah. mia is not skilled like kalk is he is much more just blunt force you know sure Welcome Dunk, to the Big Ten. Yeah, dunks, layups, putbacks. He's not going to shoot from more than a few feet out. Right. But just, you know, and, you know, maybe la last year when Cre Creighton dominated, but it wasn't because of Kalk, you know. That was, no. I thought that, that, was, that was perimeter. That was Nebraska Baylor. couldn't. Yeah, Baylor. Nebraska couldn't hit a shot. Yeah. Uh, Creighton caught fire. Kalk wasn't the reason Creighton no. dominated that no. game, but – I am fascinated just seeing two seven one centers going at it. So that's what that's what Mia brings to the table. And then Berke, another guy who just I don't it's hard to know what to expect from him. His best the best basketball he's played in his right. career was not last year at UCLA. It is internationally. That is where he has been that is where he showed like what he can do and where and that's the guy Nebraska wants him to be. There Yeah. They're high on him as a guy who can handle the ball, pass, shoot, and you know the shooting. The stats haven't real didn't really back it up last sure. year at UCLA. But this coaching staff, I know, is high on that ability again, in part because of what he's done in international play. Speaking and, of international players, yeah, Fedor Zugic. Fedor Zugic kind of leads me right. Are, into, I was gonna say, uh, are we flo are we just are we flowing right yeah, into? Yeah, I think uh, so. I, yeah. I think that's a perfect segue yeah, into beautiful what, what position Seamless. group I think yeah. is you know the most vital. Creighton is so 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 set in the front court. You know, barring injury, knock on wood. Yeah, Creighton is so set in the front court because of Ryan Kalkbrenner. There are some questions at the four certainly, and I'll talk about those here in a second. And there are some questions behind Ryan Kalkbrenner. Is Isaac Trout going to play a small ball five again? Is Jackson McAndrew going to be so defensively improved that he could play a small ball five? Um, is Fred King vastly improved after taking a dip into the transfer portal, coming out of it, and returning to Creighton? There are a few questions in the front court, but when you have Ryan Kalkbrenner, most of those are answered. The... I, I think on the wings is where Creighton has, you know, kind of the biggest questions to answer. I really do. Um, you know, for, uh, let, let's take a step back and look at it, you know, macro for a second. You have Jason Green returning after breaking out at the end of last year. 
You have Isaac Trout, who I'd consider to be more of a smaller stretch five or a bigger four, but certainly is still going to play a role on the wings either way. Um, you have Mason Miller, who started, I think, almost every game last year. Maybe he missed one. I can't remember. Um, or didn't start one. But you have Mason Miller, um, who won the preseason position battle a year ago between Jason Green, Miller, and Isaac Trout. He's coming back. And then you have Fedor Zugic and Jemiah Neal, uh, you know, kind of two newcomers. Um, Jemiah, Arizona State transfer they got out of the portal. Fedor Zugic, international prospect who filled the last scholarship. International man of mystery. International man of mystery. And that's, that's damn good <laughs> because this is not your grandpa's freshman. <laughs> I mean, he kind, he kind of is. He could be a freshman's grandpa, <laughs> but he's not your grandpa's freshman. Um, I like how we talk about a guy who's 21, <laughs> who's like he's ancient, few, like right. we're not several years right, older than that. Right. And in and, and that Fedor and, and everything that transpired around him, I think is the most interesting piece of this team, period. And certainly on the wing, because it decides so much. Let's start there at the three. Um Jemiah Neal, hard-nosed defender, high flyer, really quick first step, sh has struggled to shoot the ball in his career. Didn't really have an expanded role until last year at Arizona State, but he's a career 26.9% three shooter. Like, that's typically not the player that fits in Creighton's offense. Yeah. Greg McDermott hopes that he's going to be much improved with, you know, an off season in trying to get used to the program. Um, although it's a steep learning curve, uh, but, but they think Jemiah getting out of Arizona state, being in a new setting, being in a new system that focuses on turning, you know, a good look to a great look will help him. I think so too. But then they have, uh, Fedor Zugic. Um, he was less than 16 when he debuted in the Euro league, still the youngest player to ever play in the Euro league. Um, does a little bit of everything. He's a, he's a three-point shooter at heart. I think he'd be the first person to tell you that. I think he was on like 45, 36, 74 splits last year um, and through like 47 games, I think is what it was. Um, so a, a guy who can do a little bit of everything. Uh, I think 11 points, a couple of rebounds, a couple of assists. And so that's where it gets interesting because who's going who's gonna to replace Baylor Shireman? Um, and, and neither one of them have shied away from doing that. Jemiah said, who doesn't want to be Baylor Shireman? That means you're yeah. one of the best players in the country. Yeah. And Fedor said, I've watched film on Baylor to see how he did that role and, you know, some things that maybe I could pick up on from his game and how he fit here. Um, but no one, Fedor included, knows what is going to happen with his eligibility. And that's the long meandering point here is – you have this international prospect, one of the best international newcomers in the country this year. Loads of experience overseas. Won a bronze medal at the FIBA European Championships. But no one knows if he'll be able to legally, by the NCAA, be able to play. Um, it's out of Creighton's hands. It's out of his hands. He has lawyers. Creighton has lawyers. The NCAA has lawyers. They've all been working together to try and make this work. Um, again, we're recording this on Friday. I'll have a story out Saturday morning of Fedor pretty much saying that's the most frustrating part. Yeah. He's really optimistic because everything that he's heard would indicate that he's going to be able to play. But that frustrating part, he doesn't know when that's going to be. Yeah. Um, so that's really it. Um, at the three, I think those will probably be your two starters, either Jemiah or Fedor, uh, depending on what happens. And uh, then you have, you know, again, another position battle for the second year in a row with Mason Miller and Isaac Trout and Jason Green. Um, I think Jason Green's the front runner, which sounds really weird to say, considering how good Mason Miller has been at Creighton. But when I talked to Greg McDermott, one of the things that they were worried about replacing the most in what they lost with Trey Alexander and Baylor Shireman was the rebounding. Jason Green, he showed at the end of last year, has a knack for rebounding. 
especially on the offensive end. Um, so that's, that's why I think Jason Green might have a leg up here, but who knows? Three different players, three entirely different skill sets. Um, I think all three of Miller, Trout, and Green get playing time, significant playing time, really. Um, but what's that going to look like? I don't know. We'll find out in the exhibitions, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, which kind of... Speaking of which. Speeds, <laughs> lead, lead, leads us right into that one, Wilson. You're yeah, rolling we, today. We're rolling. We're just on fire here. Creighton has an, a, a pretty marquee exhibition. Um, Nebraska has a pretty marquee exhibition this weekend. <laughs> um, but we're going to learn a lot about these teams. Kind of we talked about a little bit ago. Creighton, the number 15 team in the country in the preseason eight, AP Top 25 host Purdue, I believe number 14 or number 13. Um, so we're getting a top 15 matchup in a charity exhibition. All the proceeds are going to go to, I believe, the United Way of the Midlands. I'm so sorry if I messed that up. <laughs> um, for the, uh, you know, for people who are affected from the tornadoes in April. Um, so that's what the charity exhibition's for. But on top of that, aside from being for a good cause, it's going to be some damn good basketball, I yeah. think. Um, you have some familiarity with Purdue. I do. I have some familiarity with Purdue because I've been reading all about them <laughs> for the last week and a half. Um, what do you expect this weekend at the CHI Health Center when Creighton and Purdue square off? I know it's an exhibition. I should yeah. make that clear. But I, mean, I like, understand. It's, it's an exhibition. Like, everyone's going to be playing hard. You know, there are yeah. going to be two coaches, right, who are going to be playing this to win. Right? Absolutely. It's not just, you know – wrote you know pl not playing everyone right yeah yeah i i wouldn't think so um like they will i'm sure both yeah. coaches will deploy their bench yeah but yeah so you're not, not they're gonna, gonna play, try not gonna play a guy 38 no, minutes no, no, in no, no, no like ryan kalkbrenner played the played just the first half of creighton's exhibition yeah. against closed exhibition against uh iowa state you know so like no, if Ryan Kalkbrenner plays past halftime, maybe a little bit, I guess, because it's Purdue yeah. in an open setting. Um, but it, I don't think Ryan Kalkbrenner will be on the floor with three minutes left. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. Um, so, I, yeah, well, I, 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 I don't know. I yeah. don't know. But to, to answer your, your question, I'm interested in this will be our first look at a post-Zach E.D. Purdue team. Yeah, yeah. And it is not easy for them because – Ryan Kalkbrenner will be yeah. on the other sideline. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, unfortunately, we didn't, we were not getting the E.D. Kalk uh, clash had of it. the Titans. We should have had it seven had. months ago, Wilson. <laughs> should have had it. And we are all worse off. And Tennessee <laughs> ripped off an 18 nothing run in the second half, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> womp womp. Yeah. So we don't get that. But um, I think, you know, how Purdue handles Kalk is something I'm looking for. Just Absolutely. They don't have a seven foot four dude to throw at him like they would have seven months ago. I, I want to see, on that note, sorry to interrupt you, no, I, I want to see far. how Creighton attacks a team without Zach Eady. Yeah. In theory, you should feed, you should and should be able to feed Ryan Kalkbrenner yeah. against most teams in the country. Yeah. But knowing that's a spot where Purdue is not as strong. I'm sure Matt Painter has a couple yeah. more 7'4 guys on the roster. Wh Wilberg, yes. Like, he is from Northern Europe. I'm not yeah. going to say a country because I forget. I don't want to get wrong, like Sweden or Finland or one of those. But, like, uh, those guys are nowhere near experienced yeah. as Zach Eady, and they're certainly not as experienced as Ryan Kalkbrenner is this, will be this year and is already, obviously. So that's what I want to yeah. see when it comes to the post. Can Creighton, will Creighton take advantage of a team where it's weak? Yeah. And can Creighton's star player fully take advantage of that? Yeah. Um, you know, aside from the wings, that's one of the things. I, I, we know what we're getting in Steven Ashworth. I think Pop Isaacs is going to take a little bit to settle in. He's still trying to get his feet fully under him because he had off-season hip surgery to repair a uh, torn labrum. It's like the cartilage that holds your ball in the socket Ooh. pretty much so not a fun uh not a fun injury but he played through that most of last year and scored 15 points a game in the big 12 so i'm not worried about pop isaacs putting the ball in the bucket yeah. at all um 
but I'm obviously, as we talked about, really fascinated to see how the wings play, how the rotation goes with them, even though, again, I know that everyone will play. Really excited to see the, the three freshmen, four if you count Fedor, um, with Ty Davis and Larry Johnson and, and uh, oh my goodness, Jackson McAndrew, the highest rated recruit so program history. The, the women's team just got another player from YZ of Minnesota. Yes, the, it's a pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> YZ to Omaha. Isn't that, uh, are you glad I don't say YZ yeah, yeah. I mean, you've clear, you've clearly gotten it down. I mean, right. you, you've been you've been there, right? I've been. Uh, no, I well, went to um, Rosemont. Okay, that's where he played. Okay, when I stopped through there uh, last winter. But yeah, Wyzetta yeah. women's team just picked up another one. Yeah, you're exactly right on that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see. I don't know. Those are the things. And then yeah, can Ryan Kalkbrenner, you know, dominate a team in the post when where he should? Yeah. Um, Nebraska gets Grand Valley State. I do. Grand Valley Part One, yeah. bef- before Texas Rio Grand Valley on opening night. Yeah. What are you looking forward to from the Huskers? I am looking to see uh, the rotations. Obviously, we've yeah. talked about that. I think with Nebraska, we have a slightly better sense because we saw that intra squad scrimmage right. that, that they played. So I think right. we have a decent sense of like what the starting five will look like. Yeah. That you know, Raleigh, Bryce, Jawan, um, Barrake, and Braxton, but. And I'm just looking to see how far along this team is from a chemistry standpoint. Yeah. Because, as we know, Nebraska likes to build through the portal. That's how no Fred way. Hoiberg has assembled these teams. There's no <laughs> the way. Past, <laughs> the past couple of years. And, um, you know, and obviously there are pluses and minuses to that. You yeah. know, the advantages are that the past three years now nebraska has entered the season with a very experienced yeah. mature team that knows how to play college basketball kind of kind of been the key to success for a lot of teams recently yeah you think back to two years ago fau all yeah. of those schools get old and get old quickly was yeah kind of the key there yeah and fred has mentioned that i think he said that big 10 media days and probably another time too he said you know our goal was to stay old yeah. You know, that was a big part of their success. You know, guys like Josiah Alec, Rink Mast, Bryce Williams, they wanted to stay old. So that's that's why they do it. You know, that's yeah. why Nebraska builds its teams that way. But the other part of that is, you know, that leads you a runway of like four months, you know, from when they assemble in June yeah. to, you know, the two four week sessions there and then And you get so much preseason like yeah. preseason I'm talking about all the way back to June. Yeah. You get so much contact with the yeah. like coaches get so much contact with them now that it's not, hey, show up October fourteenth and yeah. we'll have a game on November first. Yeah. Like it that's that's gone. Those days yeah. are gone. Yeah. Which helps, obviously, yeah, when you do- have to piece a team together like this. It does. And and, and we'll and we'll see on Sunday, you know, just how far along this team is, you know, how if their chemistry is where it needs to be, because yeah. that's a thing that, you know, even for as much time as they have, you know, that's a thing that doesn't stop evolving, you no, know, that continues no. to develop weeks, months into the season. Absolutely. So I think we'll get a kind of, you know, Sunday will shine a bit of a light on just where Nebraska is in that phase. Don't know if we'll have an episode next week. Not sure, obviously. Yeah, I know. Uh, maybe we will right before the opener and after the scrimmage. I think there's, a good, I think there's a good chance and, we will. Uh, but but if we don't, or if we don't get to talk to people before then, what's your favorite Halloween candy? Oh, okay. Oh, we're we're back to the half court pressing question now. Yeah, the the pressing question. Yeah. yeah. Favorite Halloween candy? Like you you have your pillowcase, you have your yeah. bucket, you have your whatever. You get home, dump it. Yeah. Yes. Like that's it, a crunch bar. Fire. That that yeah. Fire. Like that's uh. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I need to explain it any more than that. No, it's you don't. Delicious. I will say just my own opinions. I am much more. I'm a chocolate guy. Okay. You know I don't I don't do the like, like you know sour yeah I don't I don't do that like just gummies stri- no uh, no none uh, of that fruit snacks no uh, I'm not, I'm not about any of those okay. just get give me just the straight chocolate okay. so anything that involves that I'm good with like you know crunch Twix. Kit Kat, Reese's. We got a whole bowl of um, of Kit Kat and Reese's Dude, we out have candy. there. We have candy all over our newsroom. It's awesome. It's love it. Yeah. So yeah, just but anything chocolate. That's my thing. I don't I don't mess around with the uh, 
with the weirder, you know, nah, experimental stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, we'll we'll leave the experiments to Fred Hoiberg and Greg McDermott <laughs> this weekend. Line, I don't. I don't even know if I want to acknowledge that one. These these lineups <laughs> and these rotations are their Frankenstein. <laughs> yes, I'm a Kit Kat guy. K- okay, I'm a Kit Kat guy. I love. Uh, I I do like the fruit snacks and the yeah. you, you you know the suckers and you name it. I'll eat it all. Uh, but I'm a Kit Kat guy, preferably the white Kit Kat, the okay. white chocolate Kit okay. Kat, and that's uh, slept on. Not a lot of people have that yeah. opinion, but. Uh, Big white chocolate Kit Kat. Do you guy. remember? I haven't seen one of these in like a million years. But Here's I, where we go off the rails. <laughs> yeah. This is where the episode gets really good. We're almost really at good. the end. Who cares? <laughs> this is a sign basketball, like the season really needs to get started. Yeah. But back when I was a freshman in college, <laughs> okay, um, at this little you know convenience store on the Mizzou campus, they would, and I have not seen these since like spring of 2019. Okay. They had these. They had dark chocolate Kit Kats. Do you remember those? Yeah, they. I think they, they still have them. I haven't seen. I have not seen one since freshman year okay. of college. Maybe if I see one, I'll grab you one. Yeah, I love that. I have not had one since 2019, okay. and they were fantastic. Okay. You got anything else, Wilson? I don't think so. That was the big thing for yeah. me. Uh, yeah, the Crunch Bar. Yeah. And the uh, dark chocolate Kit Kat. Yeah. Fire. Have a dark chocolate Kit Kat for Wilson. <laughs> have a white chocolate Kit Kat for me. Have a happy Halloween. <laughs> And uh, and more importantly, have a have a happy, happy, happy soon to be basketball season. Absolutely. That's gonna wrap things up for this week's episode of Half Court Press. Make sure to follow all of Wilson's coverage, all of my coverage, and everybody else's at Omaha.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you all soon.